I realize what I'm going to talk about isn't popular tonight. I realize and don't, and I fully expect, don't expect anybody to run the aisles. Don't expect anybody, hallelujah, amen. Because it's going to get down to where we live. And I was told a long time ago, 100% of the messages that you preach, you preach unto yourself. Glad to see our pastor back on the man. Amen. Does, does my heart good. God knows I I love I love that man. God knows I do. Isaiah chapter one, beginning at verse 18. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. I titled this the Crimson Tide. And I ain't talking about the football team. You know, as I think about the year past, I, I, I think and I remember the beginning of the year how I was praying really hard about things and I was really thinking about how I really want to be improved for God and the things I want to do for God. My life had dramatically changed. You know, we had moved, and, and I was thinking, you know, Lord, you're doing this for a reason, and I really want to be productive spiritually for you. And as I think back at the beginning of the year and to now, I'm disappointed. Too many slip-ups. Too many failures. Too many things that I knew better. And it's one reason when you get to the root of it all. Everything is spiritual, but it's one reason. Sin. It's quiet. I'm not saying I sin intentionally, but what I am saying is there are sins of omission and sins of commission. Well, I didn't do nothing wrong. Maybe I didn't do that. I didn't. Do, well, maybe that's the problem. You did not. I did not. Sin is a dreadful, debilitating disease that. Can, that doesn't discriminate spiritually or naturally. You sin, you die. In the spirit and in the flesh. We're born into sin. Understand that. But to continue in sin is a choice. A choice. I was born this way. I don't argue that. I was born a killer. I was born a thief. I was born this disposition. Okay. That's why the scriptures say you must be born again. It's that simple to me. John chapter 3. Nicodemus saith unto him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter into the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. That does not give us leave to do whatever we want. It does not, well, I know I wasn't supposed to do this, Lord, but forgive me. No. Don't work that way. To sin consciously is a whole nother animal. 
Brother Bernard said, the death of Christ shows that God demands punishment for all sin. If we have faith in Christ, which includes repentance from sin and obedience to his word, then Christ's death will pay the penalty of our sin. Otherwise, we will receive the punishment for our sin. In other words, if we do not repent genuinely and give it to God, Because let me tell you something, only, outside of God, only you know where you are at spiritually. You know whether what you are doing or not doing is wrong. There is not a smile, an outfit, a Pentecostal catchphrase that you can say, do, or put on that will hide your spiritual disposition. You can't. You can run up to whoever you want and praise the Lord. God bless you. Da, da, how you doing? Blessed in the Lord. Da, da. That's okay. But let me tell you something. The chicken's going to come home to roost. One day, we all will have to give account. And if it ain't but for the crimson tide, the blood of the lamb, we ain't none of us got any hope. The Crimson Tide, that famous football team. I'm talking about the blood of the lamb. That's the Crimson Tide that I need to flow over my life every single day. When I get down in prayer, when I'm having trouble, when I don't know which way is up, when I'm wondering if God hears me or even knows my name anymore. It's the blood that reminds me, that cleanses me, that encourages me. Nothing but the blood of the Lamb. Mark chapter 7, beginning at verse 5. There is nothing from without a man that enter into him can defile him, but the things which come out of him, those are they that defile the man. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was entered into the house from the people, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. And he saith unto them, Are ye so without understanding? Do you not perceive that whatsoever thing from without entereth into the man, it cannot defile him? Verse 19, Because it entereth not into his heart, but into the belly, and goeth out into the draught, purging all meats, and he said, that which cometh out of the man that defileth the man. For, for, for from within, out of the heart of man proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murderers, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, and evil eye, blasphemy, pride. All these evil things come from within and, de and defile the man. Sin carries a cost of a currency you or I don't have and can't pay. And this, we're born inherent, it's in us, in the heart. And the only way to get it out is the crimson tide. That's it. That's the only way. There's no office where you can go pay $200 an hour and cry to somebody and listen to them about your sob story. No. If you're looking for somebody to get on your side, that's the wrong approach. The approach should be simply, God, forgive me for everything I've done and let the blood come over my life. Sin is a direct challenge to God's sovereignty and authority. When God forgives sin, he doesn't excuse it. He accepts Christ's death as sufficient currency for that wage of sin. And we take that currency through repentance and apply it to our lives. We don't sin just to sin and think we can go back. No. To be free from sin and death, the law does not have the purchasing power because it's, it's of man. No legalistic, dogmatic tradition created can navigate your soul out of sin. It's only the blood. It's only the lamb. It's only repentance. It's only God. It's only Jesus. That is it. Yeah. 
Sin is real. And it's been around for a very long time. Here's a homework lesson. Ezekiel 28. There was an angel that spent a lot of time in God's presence. His body was literally instruments. A literal walking worship machine. The keyboard, the drums, the microphones, everything was built in him. Jewels, everything for the perfecting and worship of God. That's what he was for. To lead it. Now imagine this. God is light. And this angel has these rubies and all these things in them and these pipes and stuff and, and begins to lead the congregation of angels in worship. And all of a sudden, here comes God. Okay, worshiping me. That's why we do what we do, to, to bring in God's presence. It was the same principle. But this angel is literally built for that. And all of a sudden, light steps on the scene. God, as the worship's happening. And that light begins to reflect off these rubies and all these things that this angel's built on. And then this kaleidoscope of colors in this atmosphere. They're singing, worshiping. This angel's leading them and then these colors and everything. And God is light. He steps on the scene and it's beautiful and it's wonderful until that angel gets a thought. They're worshiping me. You know, this, these are the, it's reflecting off me. It's, it's my music. It's my pipes. It's my jewels. Look, that's, look, look at them. I'm leading them. And just as quick as that thought came, boom. He's cast out. You know his name? Satan. And if an angel who was built to lead worship in the presence of Almighty God can get a thought in sin, so can we. It can happen to us. Don't you sit there and think, oh, I ain't going to do what I ain't said or I ain't, I'm not. No, 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 no. It's been around a long time. Don't you let pride grip your heart like it did our eternal enemy and deny you the crimson tide to rush over your soul so that it can be forgiven for all your sins. Don't you fall for that track. No, sir. This has been going on a long time. A very long time. And none of us are exempt. Lest we think we have arrived. Lest we think we are there in our prayer life, in our ministries. <sighs> Satan had a ministry too. But well, he's Satan. He was in the presence of God. Eve, Adam, Jacob in the ladder, didn't even know. Surely God was in this place, and I knew it not. We cannot continue to let ourselves be food like we got it all together. I did a lot of reflection in this coming about this coming year. And I began to think I'm gonna do this different. You know, different convictions are coming over me and everything. Now things I'm gonna change. And I thought, why I gotta wait till the watch night service? Why I got to wait till the new year? What's wrong with now? What's wrong with getting my sins forgiven now? What's wrong with getting a deeper consecration now? What's wrong with loving God a little bit now? Come on, yeah, what's wrong with doing it now? For now is the appointed time. Now is our day. Now is our time to take back our cities, our families, our back city, loved ones. Now is our time. My dear brother getting ready to come here and he's going to
put some band-aids on the wounds and the things I done ripped off. And I know, have no doubt he's going to preach the house down. But let us remember, we ain't got to wait while you sit there in the pew. You know what I'm talking about. Come on. Well, I, it, it really ain't, you know, a sin. Or that. The very fact that you're debating it, get rid of it. Earlier, early in my career, my natural career, I was going to school and everything, and I actually got recruited by the CIA. I was happy. I ran home and told my wife, this is it. We're going to make it. I'm going to be a spook. I was so happy. I just finished school and everything. I came home. Tamika, baby, I got my handler. I just got to go here to Charlotte and take my polygraph, my lie detector test, and then I get ready to go. And she just looked at me. Hmm. I said, what in the world? No, no, I I really don't think you do it. And I didn't. I didn't go. I didn't chase the dream. And I wonder, if I did, where would I be? I wonder, what would have happened? You see, the choices we make in life determine our eternal destiny. And if we go ignorant to the voice of God, to that little twinge that we know something's not right. Well, brother, I don't know. One of the first things they taught me when, when my handler spoke to me was this. You meet me here. You don't be late. You're three minutes late. I'm gone. I'm going to the next person. And if there is any doubt, there is no doubt. I'll never forget him saying that to me. If there's any doubt, something's wrong, something's going on, there is no doubt. If there isn't any doubt, any question about some activity, something, some person, some place, some activity, if there is any doubt, there is no doubt. Get rid of it. Purge it. Dig it up by the root. Pray, repent, get it out your life. Get it out. Dig it up by the root. Let it be cast out and destroyed. Huh? Get rid of it and get a deeper consecration with God. Amen? Come on, brother. Let's clap and give Jason a hand as he comes. Praise God. Let's stand for a moment. Lift your hands. Let's pray on that word for just a moment. That was just real preaching right there. Something we all know exactly what he's talking about. Oh, God. Lord, help us to stop justifying the things we know we need to stop. Oh. Come on, let's cry out to him for a moment. We don't need a cheerleader. We can talk to God. Let's do that right now. Father, forgive us. Cleanse us from all filthiness of the flesh and the spirit. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. God, let that blood flow right now. Let it flow right now in the name of Jesus. It covers a multitude of sins. Every sin. The sin of omission. The things we know we should be doing but we aren't. The things of commission, God, the things that we aren't supposed to be doing, but we do in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm going to change right now. Hallelujah. Well, I don't know about preaching the house down, but we are going to take a slight turn here. But 
I, while he was preaching, I'm thinking, Lord, how is this connected? But it is. We're going to go from taking a look down here to taking a look at where we're going to go. Are you living for this life? Are you living for this life? Oh, everybody's saying no, but a lot of our actions are living for this life. I want to live for the life to come. You may be seated. Heaven. Close your eyes right now and just say, just say it. Heaven. What, what comes to your mind? What, what do you think about? What do you think heaven is going to look like? What do you think heaven is going to be like? When's the last time we even thought about heaven? When's the last time we said the word heaven? You know, the idea of heaven is throughout the New Testament. Jesus said he was from heaven. He told us that his father was in heaven. He said that his kingdom was of heaven. He told us that we can lay treasure up in heaven. And everybody in here wants to go to heaven. In fact, at every funeral, I've never been to a funeral where the person's going to hell. Never. They're all going to heaven. They're all going to heaven. I've been to lying, cheating, mobbed up, drunks. They're going to heaven. They're all going. That's where we all want to go. But what is it actually? Is it some mysterious, fantastical city nestled just gently in the clouds? The pictures that have been painted of this paradise of God. Well, the reality is that in the mid-90s A.D., John, who was the last apostle alive at the time, History tells us that all the other apostles and disciples of Jesus had been martyred by various kinds of death, but not John. John was banished to the Isle of Patmos, and it was on this island that God gave him a vision of the things to come. But before he gave him a vision of the things to come, We've got to understand that Revelation was, was first written to seven actual churches in Asia Minor. The first three chapters are full of God commending them on their good, him scolding them on the bad, and giving them instructions on what to do going forward with a promise of their reward if they did so. And then he goes in, starting in chapter 4, into this vision as God took him up into the heavenlies and show him the things that are to come. I mention this because if we go through this life, we are going to have struggle just like those churches struggled. If God was to write a letter to the church at Bartlett, he would tell us things we're doing good and tell us things we're doing that aren't so good. But just as we would have that today, God gave this promise to those churches and to the churches in that area that if you continue on, if you continue battling through sin, if you continue fighting through that sin nature, I'm going to give this last writing to the church, the last epistle that would be written to the people of God. I'm going to tell you what is to come if you will conquer sin and the struggles of this life. It is not by accident that God decided to close out the canon with this book of Revelation. You have to understand, the church at that time was not at the height that it was in the immediate years following the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
It was not in the throes of great revival and harvest like it had been in the 50s and 60s when, when revival was sweeping Ephesus and through Antioch and going all through Asia Minor and through North Africa. Uh, heresies and false doctrine had already taken hold and were already thriving. The apostles had been martyred off. And even in the writings of Revelation, John is given a vision of Christ winning victory, but the dragon continuing to assault the church. But then in the last two chapters, after you get through Armageddon and you get through the, the crazy bloodshed that's going to occur and you get through the, the wrath of God and, and you get through the judgment of God, all of a sudden, in John chapter number 21, he says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. God is being very deliberate here that the last two chapters that I am going to give to John for the people of God, not just for that time, not just for those seven churches, but for the church that was and the church that was to come. I want to leave this emblazed on your memory. I want this to be emblazed in the forefront that the last words I am giving you in the word of God are not what's going to happen down here, but what's going to happen over there. See, I knew this was going to happen because we don't think about heaven. And so I'm talking about heaven in the New Jerusalem. Think about it. Think about it. Heaven's not in the forefront of our mind like it should be. And we're going to go through the scriptures and talk about why we need to have this in our mindset. He said, I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adored for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. And the former things have passed away. God is giving fresh hope to a church that had been infiltrated, to a church that had been beaten up psychologically, and he's giving a message to the church today that this life is not permanent. This life is temporary, but there's coming a day when we're not going to some mysterious city in the clouds, but we're going to a new Jerusalem. This is not a mysterious location in the unknown. The Bible says there's a new heaven and the new earth. I don't have time to get into this. It's not the Bible and science class. But the, the, this universe is fading away. This universe is going to be gone. And God's going to create a new universe with a new earth in it that is not going to fade away. Where there's not going to be any destruction. There's not going to be any aging. There's not going to be any crying. There's not going to be any pain. There's not going to be any cancer. There's not going to be any divorce. There's not going to be any child abuse. It's not mysterious. In fact, uh, God gives his angel instructions to tell John exactly how big it is. This is going to blow some of your minds. But the, me the angel measures this city of New Jerusalem. It's about 1,400 miles long. It's 1,400 miles wide. It's 1,400 miles high. That means if you put the northeast corner of the New Jerusalem here in Chicago, the side goes all the way to the western border of Wyoming, and the southern border of the city goes all the way into the Gulf of Mexico. Its walls are over 200 feet thick or high. The Bible doesn't specify. From one mile away, you can't even see the top of God's city. You might be able to see the top from 10 miles away we're talking about a monstrosity that your brain can't even wrap its head around to give you perspective, if you put Mount Everest in Indianapolis with no obstruction on the perfect clear day, you might be able to see Mount Everest if it was in Indianapolis. And that's how that's the tallest thing we have in the world. But friend, from 5,000 miles away, the new Jerusalem would look 130 times bigger than the moon. It's going to be glorious. 
It's going to be incredible. Twelve gates, four, three on each side, excuse me, each made of a single pearl. The walls are made of jasper with the foundations made of every kind of jewel. The city and the streets are made out of pure gold. There's no temple in the city because God is the temple. There's river from the, there, there's water. The rivers of the water of life are flowing from God's throne through the middle of the street. On each side of the street are the tree of life with 12 kinds of fruit being born 12 times a year. There's no night, but there's no sun or moon because Jesus is the light. <laughs> Woo! I want to go to heaven. And I'm going to say this, uh, this is a positive message, but some of you are looking at me with your face glazed over. You need a reality check because if you can't get excited about heaven down here, I seriously question if you're going. The gates are never closed and nothing unclean ever enters. There's no death there's no sadness. There's no depression. There's no mourning. There's no crying over there. There's no pain over there. There's no goodbyes over there. And we'll reign with him forever and ever. I want to go. I want to go to the new Jerusalem. I don't want to spend eternity. You want to know the worst thing about hell? I don't believe it's going to be the heat. I believe it's going to be the separation from God and knowing what we're missing. Torment in hell. I, I, I don't plan. I don't plan to miss that trumpet sound. I, I don't know how you're going to live your life, but as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord, not just because of a paradise, but because I want to spend forever with Jesus. I, I'm going. I'm going. I'm not missing it. I love you. I love my family. I love this church. But let me tell you something, honey. When the trumpet goes off, sayonara. Let me tell you something in front of this place. Baby, I love you more than anything else on this world. But when that trumpet sounds, I am out of here. I'm gone, baby. I don't love this world. I don't love the things of this world. And the reason why some of us don't get excited about heaven is because when we think about heaven, the first thing you think about is what you're going to miss down here. That's why, I'm sorry, that's love priority. That's worship priority. That's idolatry. God don't want you up there. I know that's a harsh statement. That's just truth. Is that true? God wants people who want to be with him, not people who love this world, and heaven is a nice side effect of going to church. He will be our God, and we will be his people forever and ever. Have you ever thought about what we're going to do in heaven? You ever thought about it? What are we going to do? Right? It's going to be one eternal church service, right? No. It's not. Well, we're just going to sing and praise and we're going to worship. No. That's, that's not what the Bible says. We're not going to be bored. What are we going to do in heaven? We're, there's purpose down here. There's going to be purpose in the life to come. God just hasn't revealed it yet. Listen to what Jesus said when he prayed for his disciples in John 17. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am. He's talking in a spiritual state. He's talking about an eternal state. Here it is. To see my glory, that is to say his most exalted,